Chapter 1 of The Ghost, A Modern Fantasy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. The Ghost, A Modern Fantasy by Arnold Bennett. Chapter 1. My Splendid Cousin. I am eight years older now. It had never occurred to me that I am advancing in life and experience until in setting myself to recall the various details of the affair, I suddenly remembered my timid confusion before the haughty mien of the clerk at Keith Prizes. I had asked him, Have you any amphitheatre seats for the opera tonight? He did not reply. He merely put his lips together and waved his hand slowly from side to side. Not perceiving in my simplicity that he was thus expressing a sublime pity for the ignorance which my demand implied, I innocently proceeded, No balcony? This time he condescended to speak. Nothing, sir. Then I understood that what he meant was, Poor fool, why don't you ask for the moon? I blushed. Yes, I blushed before the clerk at Keith Prizes and turned to leave the shop. I suppose he thought that as a Christian it was his duty to enlighten my pitiful darkness. It's the first Rosa night tonight he said with august affability. I had a couple of stalls this morning, but I've just sold them over the telephone for six pound ten. He smiled. His smile crushed me. I know better now. I know that clerks in box offices, with their correct neckties and their air of continually doing wonders over the telephone, are not, after all, the grand masters of the operatic world. I know that that manner of theirs is merely a part of their attire, like their cravats that they are not really responsible for the popularity of great sopranos, and that they probably go home at night to Fulham by the white omnibus, or to Hammersmith by the red one, and not in brooms. I see, I observed, carrying my crushed remains out into the street. Impossible to conceal the fact that I had recently arrived from Edinburgh as raw as a ploughboy. If you had seen me standing irresolute on the pavement, tapping my stick of Irish bog oak idly against the curbstone, you would have seen a slim youth, rather naturally dressed, I think, with a shadow of brown on his upper lip and a curl escaping from under his hat, and the hat just a little towards the back of his head, and a pretty good chin and the pride of life in his ingenuous eye. Quite unaware that he was immature, quite unaware that the supple curves of his limbs had an almost feminine grace that made older fellows feel paternal, quite unaware that he had everything to learn and that all his troubles lay before him, actually fancying himself a man because he had just taken his medical degree. The June sun shone gently radiant in a blue sky, and above the roof's milky-bosomed clouds were floating in a light wind. The town was bright, fresh, alert, as London can be during the season, and the joyousness of the busy streets echoed the joyousness of my heart, for I had already, with the elasticity of my years, recovered from the reverse inflicted on me by Keith Prize's clerk. On the opposite side of the street were the rich premises of a well-known theatrical club, whose weekly entertainments had recently acquired fame. I was, I recollect, proud of knowing the identity of the building. It was one of the few things I did know in London and I was observing with interest the wondrous livery of the two menials motionless behind the glass of its portals, when a tandem equipage drew up in front of the pile, and the menials darted out in their white gloves to prove that they were alive and to justify their existence. It was an amazingly complete turnout, and it well deserved all the attention it attracted, which was considerable. The horses were capricious, highly polished greys, perhaps a trifle undersized, but with such an action as is not to be bought for less than twenty-five guineas a hoof. The harness was silver-mounted, the dog-cart itself a creation of beauty and nice poise, the groom a pink and priceless perfection. But the crown and summit of the work was the driver, a youngish gentleman who, from the gloss of his peculiarly shaped collar to the buttons of his diminutive boots, exuded an atmosphere of expense. His gloves, his scarf-pin, his watch-chain, his moustache, his eyeglass, the crease in his nether garments, the cut of his coat-tails, the curves of his hat, all uttered with one accord the final word of fashion, 
left nothing else to be said. The correctness of Keith Price's clerk was as naught to his correctness. He looked as if he had emerged immaculate from the outfitter's boudoir, an achievement the pride of Bond Street. As this marvellous creature stood up and prepared to alight from the vehicle, he chanced to turn his eyeglass in my direction. He scanned me carelessly, glanced away, and scanned me again with a less detached stare. And I, on my part, felt the awakening of a memory. That's my cousin Sullivan, I said to myself. I wonder if he wants to be friends. Our eyes coquetted. I put one foot into the roadway, withdrew it, restored it to the roadway, and then crossed the street. It was indeed the celebrated Sullivan Smith, composer of those so successful musical comedies, The Japanese Cat, The Arabian Girl, and My Queen. And he condescended to recognise me. His gestures indicated, in fact, a warm desire to be cousinly. I reached him. The moment was historic. While the groom held the wheeler's head and the twin menials assisted with dignified inactivity, we shook hands. How long is it? he said. Fifteen years about, I answered, feeling deliciously old. Remember I punched your head? Rather. Somehow I was proud that he had punched my head. No credit to me, he added magnanimously, seeing I was years older than you and a foot or so taller. By the way, Carl, how old did you say you were? He regarded me as a sixth-form boy might regard a fourth-form boy. I didn't say I was any age, I replied, but I'm twenty-three. Well, then, you're quite old enough to have a drink. Come into the club and partake of a gin and angostura, old man. I'll clear all this away. He pointed to the equipage, the horses and the groom, and with an apparently magic word whispered into the groom's ear, he did in fact clear them away. They rattled and jingled off in the direction of Leicester Square, while Sullivan muttered observations on the groom's driving. Don't imagine I make a practice of tuning tandems down to my club, said Sullivan. I don't. I brought the thing along today because I've sold it complete to Lottie Cass. Oh, you know her, of course. I don't. Well, anyway, he went on after this check, I've sold her the entire bag of tricks. What do you think I'm going to buy? What? A motor car, old man. In those days, the person who bought a motor car was deemed a fearless adventurer of romantic tendencies, and Sullivan so deemed himself. The very word motor car then had a strange and thrilling romantic sound with it. The deuce you are! I exclaimed. I am, said he, happy in having impressed me. He took my arm as though we had been intimate for a thousand years, and led me fearlessly past the swelling menials within the gate to the club smoking room and put me into a grandfather's chair of pale heliotrope plush in front of an onyx table, and put himself into another grandfather's chair of heliotrope plush. And in the cushioned quietude of the smoking room, where light-shod acolytes served gin and angostura, as if serving gin and angostura had been a religious rite, Solomon went through an extraordinary process of unchaining himself. His form seemed to be crossed and recrossed with chains, gold chains, at the end of one gold chain was a gold cigarette case from which he produced gold-tipped cigarettes. At the end of another was a gold matchbox. At the end of another, which he may or may not have drawn out by mistake, were all sorts of things, knives, keys, mirrors and pencils. A singular ceremony. But I was now in the world of gold. And then smoke ascended from the gold-tipped cigarettes as incense from censers, and Sullivan lifted his tinted glass of gin and angostura and I, perceiving that such actions were expected of one in a theatrical club, responsively lifted mine, and the glasses collided, and Sullivan said, Here's to the end of the great family quarrel. I'm with you, said I, and we sipped. My father had quarrelled with his mother in an epoch when even musical comedies were unknown, and the quarrel had spread, as family quarrels do, like a fire or the measles. The punching of my head by Sullivan in the extinct past had been one of its earliest consequences. "'May the earth lie lightly on them,' said Sullivan. He was referring to the originators of the altercation. The tone in which he uttered this wish pleased me. It was so gentle. It hinted that there was more in Sullivan than met the eye, though a great deal met the eye. I liked him. He awed me, 
and he also seemed to be somewhat ridiculous in his excessive pomp. But I liked him. The next instant we were talking about Sullivan Smith. How he contrived to switch the conversation suddenly into that channel I cannot imagine. Some people have a gift of conjuring with the conversations. They are almost always frankly and openly interested in themselves, as Sullivan was interested in himself. You may seek to foil them. You may even violently wrench the conversation into other directions. But every effort will be useless. They will beat you. You'd much better lean back in your chair and enjoy their leisure domain. In about two minutes, Sullivan was in the very midst of his career. I never went in for high art, you know, all rot. I found I could write melodies that people liked and remembered. He was so used to reading interviews with himself in popular weeklies that he caught the formalistic phraseology, and he was ready, apparently, to mistake even his cousin for an interviewer. But I liked him. And I could get rather classy effects out of an orchestra. So I kept on. I didn't try to be Wagner. I just stuck to Sullivan Smith. And my boy, let me tell you, it's only five years since the Japanese cat was produced. And I'm only twenty-seven, my boy. And now who is there that doesn't know me? He put his elbows on the onyx. Privately, between cousins, you know, I made seven thousand quid last year and spent half of that. I live on half my income, always have done, always shall. Good principle. I'm a man of business, I am, Carl Foster. Give the public what they want and save half your income. That's the ticket. Look at me. I've got to act the Duke. It pays, so I do it. I am a Duke. I get tuppence apiece royalty on my photographs. That's what you'll never reach up to, not if you're the biggest doctor in the world. He laughed. By the way, how's Jim getting along? Still practising at Totnes? Yes, I said. Doing well? Oh, so-so. You see, we haven't got seven thousand a year, but we've got five hundred each, and Jem's more interested in hunting than in doctoring. He wants me to go into partnership with him, but I don't see myself. Ambitious, eh, like I was? Got your degree in Edinburgh? I nodded, but modestly disclaimed being ambitious like he was. And your sister, Lillian? She's keeping house for Jem. Pretty girl, isn't she? Yes, I said doubtfully. Sings well, too. So you cultivate music down there? Rather, I said. That is, Lillian does, and I do when I'm with her. We're pretty mad on it. I was dead set on hearing Rosetta Rosa in Lohengrin tonight, but there isn't a seat to be had. I suppose I shall push myself into the gallery. No, you won't, Sullivan put in sharply. I've got a box. There'll be a chair for you. You'll see my wife. I should never have dreamt of going. Wagner bores me, though I must say I've got a few tips from him. But when we heard what a rush there was for seats, Emmeline thought we ought to go, and I never cross her if I can help it. I made Spart give us a box. I should be delighted to come, I said. There's only one Smart, I suppose. You mean Sir Cyril? The same, my boy. Lessie of the Opera, Lessie of the Diana, Lessie of the Folly, Lessie of the Ottoman. If anyone knows the colour of his cheques, I reckon it's me. He made me. That I will say. But I made him too. Queer fellow. Awfully cute of him to get elected to the county council. It was through him I met my wife. Did you ever see Emmeline when she was Sissy Vox? I'm afraid I didn't. You missed a treat, old man. There was no one to touch her in boys' parts in burlesque. Dash fine woman she is. Though I say, dash fine. He seemed to reflect a moment. She's a spiritualist. I wish she wasn't. Spiritualism gets on her nerves. I've no use for it myself, but it's her life. It gives her fancies. She's got some sort of silly notion. Don't tell her I said this, Carly, about Rosetta Rosa. Says she's unlucky. Rosa, I mean. Wanted me to warn Smart against engaging her. Me? Imagine it. Why, Rosa will be the making of this opera season. She's getting a terrific salary, Smart told me. It's awfully decent of you to offer me a seat. I began to thank him. Ah, stuff, he said. Cost me nothing. A clock struck softly. Christopher, it's half past twelve, and I'm due at the Diana at twelve. We're rehearsing, you know. We went out of the club, arm in arm, Sullivan toying with his eyeglass. Well, you're toddling round tonight, eh? Just ask for my box. You'll find they'll look after you. So long. He walked off. I say, he cried, returning hastily on his steps and lowering his voice. When you meet my wife, don't say anything about her theatrical career. She don't like it. She's a great lady now. See? 
Why, of course, I agreed. He slapped me on the back and departed. It is easy to laugh at Sullivan. I could see that even then, perhaps more clearly then than now. But I insist that he was lovable. He had little directly to do with my immense adventure, but without him it could not have happened. And so I place him in the forefront of the narrative. End of chapter 1